ルノッチー。Hidamari sketch is the solution to all of mankind's unsolved problems. It is the cure for cancer, HIV, and even Asperger's. If you showed Hidamari sketch to a malnourished African child, he'd most likely feel a little less hungry. Even my cat loves it. Now, as much as I wish the rest of the video could just be me making wide jokes while abusing the ever loving shit out of the scale width option, I'm actually going to do my best to justify why this series about mutated potato girls is one of the greatest things ever made. And in order to do that, we're gonna need to cover a little history. <laughs> Hidamori Sketch began in 2004 when it was first published as a monthly four coma comedy manga in the magazine Manga Time Kirara Carrot. The illustrious author behind the series is Ume Aoki, the woman famous for being the first metapod to make a name in the manga industry. Outside of her magnum opus, Aoki is most well known for being one quarter of the team responsible for the hit show Magic Mike, where she worked alongside one of anime's most famous modern directors, Akiyuki Shinbo. Around the same time Hidamari Sketch was first being published, Shinbo was also quickly rising in notability as the new spearhead of animation studio Shaft. And it wouldn't be long before the two forces came together to produce one of the most beautiful babies to ever be birthed by anime. <laughs> 2007 was quite possibly the most significant year in the history of Slice of Life anime. And that's fairly impressive considering the year before that was when nobody could get Haruhi's figurative cock out of their throats. Many of these shows from the end of the 2000s still resonate in culture to this very day, and receive a steady stream of fan adoration 15 years later. But it's hard to say the same for Hidamari. Scroll through any form of social media and see how long it takes for you to see an image of Konata, or Yui, or any other Kyoani girl. And then see how long it takes to see Yuno's smug mug pop up. Now, this isn't to say the fanfare for the show is dead, far from it. But, by god, it sure does seem to be the one child left out of the party when it comes to naming the best shows of its genre. Maybe you just have to be a special breed to truly appreciate something so exceptionally magnificent. I mean, my teachers always told me I was special. That must be the case. Baka. What's difficult to get about H-Sketch? Uh, nothing, really. The premise boils down to a couple of high school girls living in the same apartment complex right across the street from their autistic school. I mean, art school. They eat enough food to feed Southeast Asia and have long-winded conversations about how pleasant and carefree their lives are. I'm sounding a little cynical when I talk about this, but that's mostly because I'm trying to mask how embarrassingly giddy this show makes me. I'm gonna preface the rest of the video with this one statement. Hidamari sketch can only make you feel good. Even if you walk away from this anime with unmet expectations in a sense that your time has been wasted, you most definitely can't walk off without feeling a little tingle in your heart and a sensation of clarity in your mind. One of the best parts about the show is that, due to the lack of an overarching narrative, you can basically flip on any random episode out of the bunch and watch to your heart's content without worrying about missing any information essential to enjoying the experience. And it's a good thing, too, because this anime is long. It's not Mike Matei long, but for a slice of life, it can seem a little intimidating. Counting every existing season, including the OVAs, Hidamari Sketch rounds up to 60 episodes. That's only four away from being as long as something like Full Metal Amputee. Covering the whole series in a short span of time can be a little bit daunting. And guess what? I'm gonna do it right now! We're gonna take a trip through all four seasons of Hidamari, showcasing every character and every element of the production that's turned it into one of the all-time classics of its genre. If you're going into this blind and are worried about spoilers, then don't worry because there's only one. The apartments blow the fuck up.
No, that was just a little joke. All right, let's rock and roll. The inaugural first season of Hidamari Sketch, as you'd expect, provides a proper introduction to every defining feature that the show would go on to carry for its entire run. I think the first feature worth noting is the anachronic timeline the episodes are presented in, because for some reason this seems to trip people up on their initial viewing. See, the original manga was pretty chronological with its events. It starts with Yuno moving into her new apartment, making all her new friends, and then a whole bunch of stuff happens over the course of a year. The anime decided to do things out of order and have each episode take place in a different month of the year. Hence why the first episode takes place in January and everybody already knows each other. However, the jumbled timeline doesn't really alter how the show is perceived. Every episode is self-contained and can be viewed in practically whatever order you want. You can look up a list detailing the proper numbering for every episode if that's how you want to experience it. I've tried watching the show both ways and I can tell you right now, it doesn't make that much of a difference if you start in April and then jump to December. What does make a difference is the setting, which the first episode establishes as compact yet convenient. Hidamari So is the apartment complex that sits literally a crosswalk's length away from Yamabuki High School, where, wouldn't you know it, everyone who also lives at the apartments happens to attend. It's a small world for the characters, but it's home. And by keeping the setting confined to such a limited scope, it allows that welcoming, homey feeling to become a ubiquitous motif of the series. These characters are gonna be your best friends by the time this whole thing is through, and Hidamari So is gonna be the cramped, musty apartment you wish you could have lived in through college. Speaking of characters, it's time we get acquainted with the tenants of this place. So let's begin with the girl living upstairs in room 201, Yunochi. You know. Astoundingly cute. Astonishingly short. The only girl whose parents actually supported their daughter's decision to go to art school. You might make the mistake of dismissing Yuno as the cliché timid girl with a heart as pure as distilled water with a personality as uninteresting to match, but that's a critical misjudgment. Yuno is an individual of mysteries stacked upon enigmas layered within questions. Questions like, why does she wear oversized X's on her head? How did she get to be so good at singing? How does she afford this many fucking bath bombs? What I appreciate the most about Yuno is how much the show hammers in early on that she's truly the epitome of helpless. Can't finish her assignments. Can't stop falling asleep in class. Can't swim. Can't even shampoo her hair without closing her eyes cause it's gonna get in there and it's gonna burn and it's gonna hurt real bad. She's easy to love. And even easier to root for when you know she's trying to compete with a score of other people all aiming to become talented artists. It makes the rare moments where she receives some kind of victory all the more effectual. Like when her unfinished drawing is praised by a bunch of hipsters who think it's supposed to be some kind of thoughtful statement when in reality she just fell asleep on the job. I really enjoy the fact that Yuno's artistic abilities could be considered substandard. It'd be much more difficult to support her personal struggles if she was automatically a gifted artist impressing everyone with her flawless masterpieces. Even though her work itself is pretty impressive for her age, Yuno doubts herself to a point where whatever skills she possesses don't even seem to matter. As with any self-respecting artist, she can't immediately see the value and quality of her own work, critiquing herself more harshly than any of her peers and teachers ever would. The self-esteem crisis combined with the fact that she's living all by herself, starved of parental guidance, pushes her from a helpless blob of cute to a sympathetic struggler desperately in need of a hug. What keeps her going, however, are the hands of everyone else at Hidamari So on her shoulder. They feed her, tutor her, and make her smile on each and every day of the year. Her feelings of ineptitude are only a temporary roadblock, and even if they pop up more than once throughout the series, the encouraging voices of those closest to her keep them at bay. 
Yuno's endearing appearance and attitude lend her the ideal traits for a protagonist, but she's only one piece of a wider puzzle. As mentioned before, Yuno isn't who she is without her friends to keep her going. So, what's so special about the other girls living at Hidamari Apartments? <laughs> Miyako, Miyachan, Eater of Worlds. <laughs> I'm very open about my unabashed adoration for Genki girls. You know, some people prefer quiet, mysterious girls. For others, it's the angry, abusive ones. I just like the happy ones. The girls bursting with energy that make it impossible for your day not to feel brighter automatically. As you might imagine, this not only means that Mia is my absolute favorite part of Hidamari's sketch, but also one of my favorite characters from anything to ever exist. Miyako is the sunshine in Sunshine Sketch, even though that's not the actual translation. Mia's eternal optimism and miraculous ability to lift the spirits of everyone she interacts with has certainly made her a shining symbol of Hidamari's appeal. Always cheering for Yuno, always driving Sai crazy with her energy, and always poking fun at Hiro for being obese are just a few of the ways that Mia livens up the ordinarily quiet atmosphere of Hidamari So and turns it into a party. And all of this is quite surprising, because if anyone in the cast has a reason to not feel joyful, it's her. <laughs> Miyako is repeatedly asserted to be the designated poor kid of the school. Her clothes are all hand-me-downs from her brother, She's forced to live in the one apartment that isn't even fully renovated because it's cheaper. And worst of all, the world has cursed her with the appetite of a whale, yet denies her the money necessary to satisfy it. She lives off the generous meals provided by her friends and continues getting by with what little money her presumably impoverished family can provide. Given all this tragic bullshit the universe has dealt her, Mia's ability to shrug off all feelings of negativity and sadness like rain off an umbrella seems almost superhuman. No matter what storm is sent to shake up her humble life, she always reacts with the wide grin of ignorant bliss. Even if she can't afford the most basic of amenities, she makes up for it with her status as a full-fledged creative genius. Mia's genuine talent for art is what separates her from the others. If there's anyone that legitimately deserves to be attending Yamabuki for the sake of developing her gift, it's her. Hence the reason she was able to get in on recommendation alone. Her talents don't end with art, but extend to all areas of the humanities, from singing, to fishing, to doing really good animal impressions. Her greatest talent bar none, of course, is spreading cheer and hope to everyone willing to accept her eager friendship. The boundless enthusiasm may potentially annoy some people, usually because they were born unloved and unwanted and are also devoid of a soul. But Miyako's gleeful spirit is an essential ingredient to the dynamic shared by Hidamari Sketch's cast. Because without Miyako's radiating rays of sunshine, who else is gonna be there to warm up Yuno when she's down? Yunochi! Yuno and Mia share their status as first years when the show begins, but instead of featuring a cast consisting of girls all in the same grade experiencing all the same things, Ume Aoki chose to add a corresponding pair of second years to act as the girls' mentors for the series. And the first of that pair I'd like to talk about is one tentacle-haired master chef named Hiro. <laughs> You want some kind of dad? Ah! Hiro is the official mom of Hidamari So. She puts food on the table every night for each hungry mouth that won't get the fuck out of her kitchen. And she also has a tendency to beat those same hungry mouths, just like a real mom. Outside the occasional temper flare, Hiro is almost so sweet it hurts. This level of kindness is usually best saved for deceptive villains trying to win the hearts of the easily fooled. But from Hiro, it's all genuine. I don't know what possesses her to be the official food supplier of the group, or why she makes it her personal responsibility to make sure her wife Sai doesn't die from exhaustion, but she's the kind of neighbor the world can never have enough of. 
Her only real weakness as a person is that she suffers from terminal obesity. I've seen the my character is too perfect so I'm just gonna make them obsessed with weight loss trope tossed around quite a bit and as tired as it may get at times it's still really funny when Mia calls Hero fat. I'm sorry. See, look at it this way. Without Hero, there's a high probability that all the other girls would be dead. And without the other girls, Hero would most likely be dead from anorexia. It's a very mutualistic relationship. Hero receives greater development and insight into her fears and concerns later on down the line. But for this introductory season, she's just the caring motherly lady downstairs with an overwhelming desire for cake and a heart as big as the pudge on her belly. Yeah! Okay, that's the last fat joke, I promise. Hero can be the best mom a pair of spoiled kids can ask for, but she needs a stern dad-like figure to balance things out, which is where the rather boyish, bespectacled upperclassman Sai comes in. <laughs> Sai's placement at Yamabuki High School is perplexing. Her forte is writing and literature. Art is something that exists mainly as a hobby or secondary interest. Her appreciation for it grows with each year she spends at the school, but her learning ultimately is doing very little to aid the career path she's treading down. Regardless of her aspirations, the relationships she forms between her neighbors and her best friend slash housewife hero are more important than any kind of formal education. Sai appears to everyone else as the cool, mature senior figure with all the wisdom an elder can give. And she goes to great lengths to preserve this image by making up lies about all the dudes she totally dated and all the sexual hand-holding experience she's definitely had. As the only student at Yamabuki who's technically making a living through a creative outlet, Sai provides an interesting look at how doing what you love is not always as fun as one might imagine. She's a published author writing mostly cheesy romance stories for a magazine popular among closeted lesbians, and she takes that occupation as seriously as a passionate writer of any material would. Sometimes her dedication to her work causes a rift between her and the other residents of Hidamari So, and her serious demeanor in general goes as far as straining her relationship with her younger sister Chika, who wants nothing more than to have a bigger role in her life. If Sai didn't have the backing of Hiro and the chipperness of the first years, her life would likely be extensively messier than the way it appears now. She can be an intelligent voice and a wise counselor when she's called upon, but she'll likely never fess up to how much the other girls really mean to her. And that's what I believe separates the central cast of Hidamori Sketch from its contemporaries. The fact that the four girls are dependent upon each other. Most slice-of-life comedies feature a dynamic cast of such varying personalities that it's difficult to imagine those characters ever befriending each other in reality. However, Hidamari's convincing portrayal of four friends bound together primarily through their living situation gives a new layer of camaraderie to the bunch. Even when they get fed up and fight one another, the fact that they're practically dependent upon each other allows them to almost immediately make amends and move on. It's one of the most believable fictional friendships I've ever seen, and the chemistry the group shares has always been one of the series' most gravitating draws for those already well-versed in the cute girls doing cute shit genre. It's enough to make you watch and go, Damn, those four are so open and honest with each other. I sure do wish lifelong friends that care for you and always have your back were a real thing and not exclusive to fiction. Ha <laughs> ha. By this point, after seeing some clips of the show and exposing your eyeballs to just a little bit of the scenery it has to offer, you most likely have one big question burning in the back of your mind. Why the hell does it look like that? No, I'm not referring to how everyone looks like a deflated balloon half the time. I'm talking about the lack of backgrounds, spliced visual mediums, and the abundant usage of pointillism that makes the whole anime look like an advertisement for Hobby Lobby. The easy answer is that it's a Shaft anime. 
which means being stylistic is the top priority. That's a generalization for sure, but the truth is that many of the artistic choices that would go on to be a staple of Hidemari's sketch were made purely for economic reasons. This first season was notoriously put together on a budget of belly button lint, meaning the staff had to pull off as many tricks and cost-cutting measures as possible. And what they came up with was a presentation that uses limited animation and resources to its advantage. It's hard to guess from the simplicity, but the amount of thought and attention given to each individual aspect of Hidemari's design reaches Kubrickian levels of detail at times. For example, Tatsuya Oishi, the designer in charge of planning the layout for each girl's room, was given specific instructions from Shinbo who called for things like a select few fixed camera angles and color schemes to match the personality of the characters. As the first season progresses, the audience begins to associate certain colors and symbols with the respective girl, which both saves money on animation since the visuals can be reduced to a single icon, while also achieving a stylized appearance that fits with the art-centered subject matter. Another famous design choice from the show is the implementation of real-life photographs that make up certain objects and picture frames occupying the background. I've always called it the collage art style, mostly because it resembles an art student's hastily slapped together midterm scrapbooking project. Which just so happens to be exactly what Yuno is working on in the first episode, holy shit! All of these creative additions give the show a unique identity, and at lots of times can produce a surreal, dreamlike look that makes the already relaxing viewing experience even more enjoyable. The best example of this is the fifth episode where Yuno's forced to stay in bed due to illness and has a bizarre series of fever dreams. Or in this case, Shaft's wet dreams, since you get to see all the weirdest abstract imagery the staff could pluck from whatever scene from Yellow Submarine they were watching. I've got a hole in me pocket. I found in retrospect that Season 1's lack of polishing given to later seasons has made it feel like its own distinctive beast. You can immediately tell upon re-watching these early episodes that they were down to their last pack of ramen and had very little time left to pump out something elaborate. So instead, they made up for their dwindling resources by embracing the quirky, low-budget, but wonderfully colorful design that everyone immediately associates with Hidemari So and the wides inhabiting it. The look certainly improves going forward, but... I'd be lying if I said I didn't miss the extremely laid-back coziness of this first season's appearance. Shaft likely knew they had something special on their hands based on how much care was placed into creating an unmistakable aesthetic, and luckily it would only be a year until they got the chance to revisit that aesthetic. Yep, just one year, 365 days, X, that's a joke, because the next season's sponsored by Microsoft. Two things happened between Hidemari Sketch's first and second seasons. One, Shaft managed to acquire more than $2.50 worth of money. And two, Yuno did not make it into Smash Bros. Brawl. One of these is less significant than the other. Hidemari Sketch X365 takes all the best attributes of its predecessor and spices them up with improved animation, better comedic timing, and more detailed designs that make it abundantly clear that Shaft has really come into their own, commercially and artistically. This season retains the non-linear timeline present in the first one, although instead of immediately moving on to a new school year, the show decides to fill in the gaps from the first year. This means we get to see several events that were teased in previous episodes, such as the obligatory sports festival, as well as a flashback to Yuno's first day moving into Hidemari So and meeting everyone. Because Season 2 expects the audience to already be familiarized with the cast and the world established in Season 1, it takes the time to elaborate on a whole assortment of secondary characters, including the chain-smoking landlady of the apartments, Sai's younger sister Chika, whoever this is, and Yuno's homeroom teacher, Yoshinoya. 
The only good instance of a teacher who came to class without pants. Yoshinoya shares a similar personality to all other incarnations of the immature, questionably responsible teacher that everyone's already seen 2,000 times by now. And because of this, it can sometimes feel like she overstays her time on screen with her limited arsenal of running gags. I do think it's funny how, by simply being the loudest and most outspoken character in the whole show, she manages to claw her way out of the category of side character and pretty much make herself the center of attention for multiple episodes. And it's very in character. <laughs> There's an indescribable number of fantastic moments from the series in 365. Too many for me to recap in one place. I'm especially fond of the episode where Mia decides to take in a stray cat without hesitation just because it randomly appeared in her room one day. Seeing her sacrifice her already measly stockpile of food to the ungrateful belly of some unnamed cat definitely communicates how caring of a person she really is. And it makes it even more heart-numbing when she wakes up a week later to find the cats vanished without a trace. It's a bittersweet moment in a show ordinarily filled with nothing but smiles and fuzzy feelings, but Mia herself eases any tension by keeping up her unbreakable smile. In her world, freedom is the most important thing, so crying over something like separation is just a waste of tears. Oh, I, I love her so much, I need that beacon of joy in my life. <laughs> Although most of Hidamari's sketch's abstract appearance spawned from necessity, Chef made the decision to retain the scrapbook look going forward since it was what made the anime stand out in an already saturated as hell market. If anything, the staff went ahead and doubled down on the simplicity of the visuals by fully embracing Akiyuki Shinbo's deranged obsession with minimalism. By this point, the four main girls are often represented by only a single symbol. Yuno is represented by an X because obviously she has her X-shaped birthmark. Mia is a cat's paw because of an earlier incident involving a race change gone wrong. Hiro is an octopus because of the similar body mass. And Sai is a pair of glasses because when you wear glasses that becomes your entire identity. No exceptions. This concept of reducing people and things into their most basic, rudimentary forms extends beyond the main cast and into every corner of the show's environment. Notice how every background extra has been damned to an eternity of life as a blue or pink silhouette, or how the background keeps getting molested by a swarm of polka dots. And of course, how could I forget the most classic shaftastic staple of all? Instead of actually animating characters walking, we're just gonna use footprints to symbolize walking. It's genius! Hi, hi. See, all of these animation techniques I'm taking the piss out of are considered calling cards of the shaft we know of today. But in the earlier years of Hidamari, this so-called style was being pioneered mostly as a way to get around the studio's own technical shortcomings. It's true Season 1 had less money than a middle schooler's lunch fund, but the actual staff comprising Shaft was just genuinely not that experienced during this time. The entire reason Shaft adopted their reputation as that one pretentious studio that does goofy shit in all of its productions is because of all the corner cutting and compromises they made just to meet their own deadlines. By the time Monogatari came around, these tried and true techniques were what they'd grown best at. And like it or not, it's still the style that sets them apart. Every anime is going to make compromises to save a few dollars. Some are just more creative at it than others. And, in my humble opinion, the minimalistic tactics of Shinbo and his team were a match made in heaven for this kind of work in particular. Ume Aoki's original four comas succeed at being funny, but the relatively empty panels leave an awful lot of room for creative experimentation. But why go to the trouble of filling in all those empty spaces? 
制約がないことがこんなに難しいと思わなかった私何が作りたいんだろう Plenty of critics like to label the more artsy decisions as added flavoring to disguise the fact that nothing is really happening at any point in time. These girls are just drinking orange juice. Why is reality warping every five seconds? Is this hell? Well, as far as I'm concerned, there is a purpose to the art. And that purpose is just one step on the staircase leading up to the central goal of Hidamari Sketch as an anime to be the most peaceful viewing experience of a lifetime. When people think of a healing anime, this and a small handful of others are the first to come to mind. One common misconception is that any easygoing slice of life can have the word Ayashke stamped on it like it's a New York Times bestseller label, but it doesn't work like that. Everything should be working in conjunction the visuals, the music, and the tone. And Hidamari nails every criteria to an exemplary degree. The simplistic style frees up your eyes and allows you to concentrate on the mood rather than stimulating visuals. The soft colors and bubbly textures aid in this as well, making sure every frame is as easy on the eyes as possible without taking away something to keep your interest. For me, the secret ingredient to Hidamari Sketch's soothing enjoyability is undoubtedly its soundtrack. Each new season brings in a new batch of songs, and every single one of them is about as serene as the sound of a saxophone beside a mountain stream. With some pretty flowers, and some deer, and maybe some toast. The music really does contribute more to the show than it gets credited for. I can probably name at least five pieces I'd consider some of my personal favorite compositions in all of anime. The dreamy quality of the show's setting can often make you wish the space you occupied could be even half as peaceful and carefree. And I feel that the music possesses the ability to transport you to that dreamlike place more than anything. Listening to some tracks in particular, it's as if you can feel the all-encompassing warmth of both the sun in the middle of spring and a blanket in the middle of winter all at the same time. This isn't the first time I've hailed Ayashke and all of its mitigating qualities. Is it unhealthy escapism leading me down the path of further closing off reality and allowing myself to be swept up in impractical visions of a greater world occupied by people with wide faces? Yeah, probably. I don't really care though. Let me raise you a question I've been trying to find the definitive answer to for years. What's the appeal of Slice of Life? Many of you likely already have an answer for that formed in your heads. Something along the lines of, It makes me happier, and it makes me feel like my brain is melting. You know, the same answer you give your parents when they ask why you won't stop snorting cocaine. Anime and drugs aren't too different. They're an easy way for people to flee from their oppressive or unrewarding lives and are potentially going to ruin their health the longer they indulge in them. The comparison is a little absurd, but I feel it's not too far-fetched to consider a show like Hidamari Sketch as one of the greatest alternative means to achieving some peace of mind. If the day has been rough and unforgiving, or if you can't seem to sleep from all the bitter thoughts clouding your head, something as simple as watching a half hour of animated bliss can be what relieves you. So even if slice of life self-insert marathons aren't really a healthy means of dealing with whatever problems we face as individuals, you can't deny that they make things seem a little happier. If only for a short period. Hidamari Sketch promises that happiness with every consecutive viewing, because Hidamari Sketch can only make you feel good. <laughs> <laughs> Both the first season and 365 offered one heartwarmingly relaxing experience after another. More joy than any fan could ask for. Shaft likely could have been satisfied with what they'd done for the series thus far and moved on to making season after season of all their other cash cows. But I have a hunch the studio just couldn't resist revisiting the most mind-numbingly, tension-relieving property they ever got their hands on. The wide ride is far from over. Hidamori Sketch X Hoshimitsu brought a fair amount of changes for the series. 
and I'd say most were for the better. The immediate change you'll notice is that the anime has gone from looking like something put together by actual art students working with scraps of paper, to something done by a full-fledged studio with lots of money, most likely made by one of the most profitable properties in anime history, who would have guessed? Even though the animation is now of its highest quality yet, the designs still carry the same charm they've had from the beginning, and the characters themselves feel more expressive than ever. Although, for some reason, everyone looks a lot shinier than usual. That damn translucent semen streak they put in everyone's hair sure does a lot. <laughs> Aesthetics aside, Hoshimitsu also reinvents the out-of-order timeline mechanic we've grown accustomed to. Episodes for this season opt for a linear format by following Yuno's second year month by month, while usually dedicating half the episode to a flashback to the year before. I'm guessing the reason for this change is the fact that there were chapters from the manga left unadapted and the studio would have felt weird if they'd left them untouched but I can see how swapping from one year to the previous one in each episode would get confusing unless you're using a Wikipedia guide or something like a nerd. The flip-flopping between school years isn't that distracting, though. It's still the same apartment, same school, same teacher, and this is supposed to be a comfy experience, and adding too much change would risk rocking the boat and nobody likes having the boat rocked. The one major shakeup in terms of story is the addition of two brand new permanent cast members. The Salon Twins. No, just kidding. It's Nori and Nazuna. I always felt bad for Nori and Nazuna. Introducing main characters midway through a manga is always a bit of a risk, because on one hand, if you don't give them enough attention, the audience might never see them as more than useless add-ons to an already impressive cast. And on the other hand, if you try to give them too much development, the audience starts to feel like the original cast they've grown to love is getting upstaged by a bunch of newcomers. Nori is challenged by this dilemma the most, since she really doesn't have that much going on for viewers to latch onto. She's a computer whiz, has her own copy of Shaft Soft Wonders and a poorly encrypted porn collection. And after that, she kind of just hangs around and looks cute with her fellow first year Nazuna. I like girls. She catches some flack for not having the most engrossing of personalities, which is sad because I happen to like her a lot. Maybe it's the cute pigtails, or her spunky attitude, or the, the, uh, other things, but I never minded her as an official member of the Hidamari clan. Her lack of a major personality quirk makes her a good foil for the older girls who by now resemble a dysfunctional family in need of a mediator, and I think that's a role Nori fills out perfectly. If everyone was as crazy as Mia, as bitchy as Sai, or as chunky as Hiro, we'd lose a sense for how endearing those traits are to begin with. Nori's personality allows her to bounce off each and every member of the cast, which is a flexibility that makes her instantly a welcome addition to a place as open as Hidamari So. But... Th that that's a bit too flattering. We all know what her real purpose in the show is. I mean, who else is gonna babysit Nazuna the bedwetter? You pathetic, mushroom-haired baby. <laughs> Nazuna was scientifically designed to have the most paddable head ever conceived for animation. Her painfully shy and helpless personality is so effective at activating the masculine hormone to protect that she has every male within a 10 mile radius lining up to do her bidding. Nazuna is often described as a Yuno clone on Moe steroids. She's the kind of girl you either fall madly in love with over how timid she appears, or the kind you'll grow to despise since every line out of her mouth makes it sound like she's having a stroke. I can't poke too much fun at her though. 
not because she's voiced by my favorite maid, but because the show goes out of its way so often to mock her for being the only girl living at the apartments, not in the art program. Like, holy shit, you're learning stuff like math and reading, and not how to draw eggplants like all the cool kids? Pfft, what a fucking normal fag, get out of here. She isn't the introverted punching bag forever though. By the end of season 3, she's literally come out of hiding and truly made herself at home with all the other residents of Hidamari So, and even starts sleeping with them, like all good friends are supposed to do. Look at that smile. By the time you get to see it, it feels earned after all that suffering. Bask in its beauty. <laughs> Her relationship with Nori is also worth noting for how heartburstingly sweet it is. Their kinship can feel a little bit like Sai and Hiro Part 2, except Nazuna is a complete failure of a cook. But I love watching them grow more and more attached as they go through the same struggles every first year has to go through together. It's also important to keep in mind that, once all the older girls graduate and disappear forever, the younger students like Nori and Nazuna will be inheriting their legacy, keeping the precious memories alive. These two are the keepers of the knowledge, the ones who will pass down the legends of You Know the Wise and Miyako the Barbarian to new generations, and they should be respected for it. New characters are cool and all, but we can't neglect the most important development of this season. Depressed Yunochi. Yunochi. For some reason, every chapter where Yuno faces some terrible existential crisis or moment of weakness ended up getting adapted in Hoshimitsu. And it can become pretty disheartening seeing Yuno do her best Madoka impression episode after episode. I do believe these are Yuno's greatest bits of growth in the series though, and also an excellent portrayal of some of the biggest insecurities faced by anyone who's ever been in a creative field. For instance, after Yuno obtains one of the lowest scores on a sketching assignment, she falls into a spiral of self-doubt and questions why she even bothers with art in the first place if it just means she's going to feel pain when she inevitably gets judged for her faults. It's a struggle that anyone who ever had a dream can most likely empathize with. Yuno doesn't match up with the best, and because of this, she thinks she's automatically no good at all. You miserable presumptuous, no talent! You're no artist! Her passions feel like a waste of time, and appear to cause more grief than good. Only after the encouraging words of her seniors, Hiro and Sai, who've already experienced those same doubts, does Yuno realize the real reason she keeps drawing, even if she's far from the best. She loves it. The incident calls back to an episode from the first season where Yuno's questioned on what her dream is, and she has no clear answer. She feels that because she hasn't settled on a clear-cut ambition involving her art, she's already lost all hope of doing anything. These depressing thoughts are untrue, of course. But when someone's as bogged down with diffidence and pessimism as much as Yuno is, it can feel impossible to escape these nagging doubts. The only difference between Yuno and the common self-effacing artist in the real world is that one might not have the luxury of loving, supportive friends willing to lend a hand of encouragement when they're down. We've all gotta be our own Miyakos. And that's not an easy task considering how hard it is to emulate perfection. Another great moment from Hoshimitsu involving Yuno is her chance encounter with the graduating senior, Arisawa, who decides to use her as a sketching model. Ha, 
The two share a conversation about life as an artist after high school, and discuss how much effort has to be put forth if one truly wants to hone their talent to its full potential. The reality intimidates Yuno, who still hasn't found her one true dream yet, but the enthusiasm from Arisawa is enough to reignite her dwindling spirits and remind her that there's no rush to pinpoint where you want your passions to take you, as long as you remain passionate about them. Arisawa graduates shortly after this, giving Yuno her first taste of bidding farewell to a mentor figure, a feeling she knows she'll have to experience again in the near future. This is the first season where the passage of time becomes strongly prevalent, and not just because of the arrival of new students, but from ongoing events in the story. A more obvious example of this would be how the girls plant tomato seeds at the start of the season, and by the last episode they've grown and ripened enough to serve an Italian family of four. However, more subtle treatment of time passing comes in the form of routine. Routine is one of the most common themes in the entire anime. Each day at the Hidamari apartments is more or less the same thing. Even when some special occurrence or shakeup happens, Yuno wakes up, walks 15 feet to school, goes back home, everyone laughs over dinner, and then she takes a bath while sharing a couple of personal thoughts. Almost every episode could be chalked up to this basic description, but the repetitive nature of the girls' lives is never treated as a bad thing the way we might view it as. There's something naturally peaceful about how incredibly unexciting or lackluster a day at Hidamari So is. Once again, every aspect of the show is working towards that common goal of providing an atmosphere as relaxing as possible. And the fact that you can almost always predict that each episode will often leave on the same satisfying note eases you into that process. One new bit of routine introduced in Hoshimitsu is how Yuno decides to start doing daily stretches, and with each passing episode, another character joins in her morning ritual. This not only demonstrates the passage of time with the expanding number of participants, but also suggests that breaking up one daily routine with another can be all it takes to make life more invigorating. <laughs> I pass out in the shower at approximately 9.30 p.m. every night. But you know what, maybe if after I did that I also clean my nasty ass shower for a change, I might have a whole new lease on life. So, is that what this is? Hidamari Sketch is now offering me life lessons? Well, no. It was always doing that. Why do you think they focused on Yuno feeling bad for not having an aspiration? Why do you think they bothered showing Sai feeling guilty for pushing away her friends to concentrate on her work? Why do you think they made a big deal out of Nazuna feeling dejected for not caring about art like everyone else around her? Hidamari has more to say about life through the lens of creativity than it may seem. Lessons about acceptance of imperfections and looking to others for inspiration run rampant throughout the entire anime, and they're the special touch that boosts Hidamari's sketch from a comforting, feel-good pleasure viewing to a work of art itself. Some say that all the greatest pieces of art have to say something, whether it's implicit or not. But what even is art? Is it a picture on a canvas, a finely composed photograph, or maybe a statue a two-year-old infant built out of dog shit? You can take anything and call it a work of art. The phrase is somewhat meaningless. Genuine masterpieces, however, have potential to affect you on a personal, even spiritual level. The reaction will never be universal, though. So, calling what one person considers art a worthless piece of trash is not only predictable, but inevitable. I can understand why not everyone would view a cheaply made anime on the level of something made by Da Vinci, but as far as I'm concerned, Hidamari's sketch meets every qualification for a masterwork. I'm gonna go out on a limb and say that there's likely been more people in this lifetime that have had greater feelings of joy and satisfaction from watching this show than those who felt similar feelings staring at any piece of modern art. The passage of time will tell if the series has potential to age as well as works of art that have survived through centuries. And even if it doesn't, it won't change how I feel about it. Time catches up with everyone and everything. So, it's time to move on.
So now we've arrived at the fourth and final season, which means it's of course going to be full of despair and anguish while repeating over and over again how depressing it is that it's all over. Actually, no, it's still pretty upbeat. In fact, Honeycomb might be the most fun, easygoing incarnation of Hidamari yet. It's true that these are the last episodes where we'll get to see the girls together as students, but it isn't treated as an apocalyptic catastrophe. It's viewed as a natural conclusion to years worth of memorable material. Why bother wasting time making everyone sad at the end when you can make the final moments together happy instead? I am very happy! Bravo! Honeycomb is the High School Musical 3 of Hidamari Sketch. Everyone's trying to settle on which direction they'll be taking for the rest of their lives post-graduation, while still aiming to maintain cordial relationships with one another. And Zac Efron is there to lighten the mood. The ones who steal the spotlight for this season are Hiro and Sai, since they're the only two actually leaving for good as graduating seniors. Hiro has her own episode documenting her fear of leaving everyone behind while still unsure if she wants to follow her goal of becoming an art teacher or not. It's funny to see that, while this whole time it seems like Yuno's been the most unconfident about her choices and talents while receiving advice from everyone around her, the same ones giving that advice are just as anxious as she is. Yoshinoya becomes an unexpected counselor for the girls and eases their fears, and it's made clear why, even after 50 episodes of improper behavior and nudity, she makes for a model teacher after all. There's a nice resolution to almost every ongoing character arc here. Even for Yuno, who experiences her first major success by utilizing her unique approach to using her memories and sentimental side in her artwork to design a pamphlet chosen to represent the school festival. For once in her life, Yuno gets to stand out from everyone else and be recognized for her talent. That enriching moment that comes about once in a young person's lifetime. As Sai and Hiro occupy themselves with studying for months on end, Yuno and Mia attempt to train themselves to take on their role as senpais by stripping Nazuna and Nori and forcing them to fondle their older, mature bodies in a pool of piss. I feel that these episodes with only the four younger girls are meant to test their chemistry for the future, a way of easing audiences into the idea of Sai and Hiro no longer being around. The characters are still fun and play off each other's strengths and weaknesses well, but there does always feel like something's missing. And that something, of course, is Hiro's weight. <laughs> With exam season approaching fast, the girls try to squeeze in as many enjoyable memories as possible before the chance is gone. And this culminates in an epic Christmas party, full of cake, fried chicken, and the surprise visit of that one green-haired girl who won't stop being a bitch all the time. So after that, the girls get ready for New Year's, and this leads to... <laughs> no. No. You didn't actually think I was gonna forget her too, did you? Natsume is the most tragic character in the entire show, without a doubt. Too overcome with her pride, insecurity, and shyness, she fails to reach out and befriend Sai like she wants to so badly and is condemned to the background, peeking behind walls and sitting with her head low by herself. For most of the show, she always seemed like a token closet lesbian who tried to rival a character she had no chance of competing with. But then, Hoshimitsu gives her a backstory episode, which reveals that Natsume is the Hidamari that never was. She commutes to school by bike and by train for an hour to and back every day, all on her own. If anyone has a reason to make their home at Hidamari So, it should of course be her. But she doesn't. On orientation day, her own mom tells her she can't make it to the entrance ceremony, her train gets stopped which makes her late, and after suffering enough to make a person break down completely, she receives inspiration from Sai. 
the first person at Yamabuki to offer her compassion. And what happens? They're separated in every class, Sai becomes so close to Hiro that they're practically a married couple, and Natsume just has to watch the whole thing, screaming internally. This is a supervillain origin story, and it makes Natsume go from an annoying side character to a pitiable girl with nothing to her name. It's for this reason that seeing her finally experience the feeling of celebrating with all the other girls and becoming closer to Sai than she ever has in three lonely years is possibly my favorite moment in the series. With December coming to a close, the girls all reconvene several days later to watch the New Year's Sunrise along with Yoshinoya, the landlady, and even the narrow-headed principal with Parkinson's. In a beautiful scene, the completed cast welcomes the start of a brand new year and the closing of a fantastic final season. Everything is blissful, and everyone is together. But of course, the good times must end eventually. A year after Honeycomb, we received an adaptation of Sai and Hiro's graduation arc, which currently serves as the formal conclusion to the entire Hidamari anime. Everything involving exams goes smoothly, of course. Both Hiro and Sai pass their tests while getting into the college they each want the most. What, did you expect something bad to happen in the show at the very end? With the pair leaving for good, all kinds of concerns linger for both the other characters and the viewers. Is the series still going to be good going forward without two essential cast members? Are Hiro and Sai going to succeed with their dreams or wind up like washed up Yoshinoya's? How in the fuck are the girls supposed to feed themselves without Hiro around to work as their slave? These are problems we're not prepared to confront. And like most fears of the future, there are no immediate answers. We simply move on and learn what the solutions are on our own. Even if the six girls are being forced to break apart and continue on their own individual paths, the emotional ties they bear to one another are unbreakable. The bond they formed over the course of two years exceeds the traditional bond of classroom friends everyone's used to. After sharing the same roof for so long, they are a family in every sense of the word. They'll never truly be apart, and they know it. <laughs> With the graduation arc over, we have now seen all there is to the Hidamari sketch anime. Is this really the end? The manga still continues to this very day, albeit it seems to exist in hiatus hell for extended periods of time. You know senior year is depicted with all the delight and humor that's been present from the start of the manga, and Hiro and Sai actually return to visit once in a while, so yeah, it's not like they died and won't ever show their faces again. More interestingly is the addition of another new student at Hidamari So, Matsuri. Her fashionable, eccentric personality makes her a force of her own despite being the only new tenant at the apartments, and her primary purpose in the series appears to be tormenting Nori, which is always a pleasure. The real question everyone wants to know is, will all these entertaining moments ever wind up being animated for us to see? And even though I'm generally quite optimistic about these things, my guess is a hesitant no. It's been 10 years since Honeycomb, and I can't help but feel that Shaft in its post-Prime era just isn't up for a hypothetical fifth season. Of course, I also have to comment on the unspeakable tragedy that is the passing of Yoshinoya's voice actor, Miyu Matsuki. There is nothing more absurdly depressing than knowing that Yoshinoya-sensei is literally dead, and it understandably makes any hope for a future season seem even less probable. Rest in peace, Miss Matsuki. You were always my favorite railroad worker. 
but even if the anime is now a relic of the past, I think we should be grateful it was around to deliver joy for as long as it was. From its humble beginning to its touching finale, it provided one of anime's most gentle and healing experiences of all time. And for some of us, it may have even reconfigured our perspectives on life and the works of art within it. What the hell does that mean? This didn't change my life. I'm still the same 60 episodes later. It was cute, and nothing more. That's totally fine if you felt that way about it. But think not of how you feel, but how you look at things. Look at a hunk of cabbage. Look at a cake someone baked for you. Look at that girl sitting sadly in the corner. Look at this statue that looks like John Lennon. Every square inch occupying Hidamari's sketch is filled with art. And not just because the whole anime is drawn by a bunch of people, which it isn't. At least, not if you count the numerous photographs of objects occupying our real world. What the show tries to do on top of everything else is answer that everlasting question of what is art. The answer it paints for us is that everything is art. Not just paintings, not just drawings, not just sculptures. Everything we see on a daily basis is art. You want to know why? Because everything was made by someone, and what you make is art. My shoe was made by a shoemaker. This is his art. My slice of bread is art. Look at how delicately crafted the grains are. Gorgeous. You are art. Like it or not, your parents made you with their blood, sweat, and tears. And sperm. Mostly sperm. This whole wide world is art. At least, when you choose to examine it through the eyes of someone as gleefully innocent as Yunochi. Does this mean that one has to be an artist to view life this way? Absolutely not. I can't draw for shit, and my only creative outlet is crappy internet videos. All you need is the ability to appreciate beauty, even in its most simplistic form. Hidamari's sketch is just one of those simplistic masterpieces, and it deserves all the admiration and applause that such a work of art warrants. It makes you laugh, it makes you reflect, it makes you inspired, it can only make you feel good. Thank you, Ume Tente, and all your lecherous, girl-lusting ways. Thank you, Shaft, for daring to do things a little differently. And thank you for watching. Love and peace.